Um, so welcome everybody to Center for Mental Health's second Festival of Ideas event. Um, today's session focuses on um, advancing racial justice in mental health. Um, and we're really interested today in hearing from our speakers around how we can spot um, and overcome the persistence of uh, racism, its impact on mental health and discrimination within services. Um, you were all expecting Antonio Ferreira, the wonderful Antonio Ferreira, um, chairing this event. Um, but unfortunately, he's having a bit of technical issues at the moment, and we're hoping he can join us a little later. Um, but my name is Kadra Abdinasa. I work at Centre for Mental Health, um, leading our work on children and young people. And we're really proud um, to be hosting this event today, shining a spotlight on racial inequalities and in mental health. Um, it's something we've been concerned with for at least the last couple of decades. Um, and we know that while some progress has been made, there's still so much more that needs to be done to create a more equitable mental health system. So today we have a really excellent lineup of speakers who will be all offering slightly different but complementary perspectives towards how we can achieve this. Um, and so once you have a chance to hear from them a little later, there will be opportunity for you to also ask them some questions towards the end. Um, before we kick off with our speakers, I just wanted to share some digital housekeeping to ensure the event runs smoothly. I know we're all used to online events by now. Um, so we are recording this event and it will be shared with everyone who signed up afterwards. Um, the chat at the moment is on uh, mute uh, as the presentations are underway, um, but then we will be reopening it a bit later for the questions and answers session. Um, so this is the second of our Festival of Ideas event, as I mentioned, is designed really for us to create some space to discuss solutions in reducing mental health inequalities. Um, and we, we use the landmark beverage reports five giants as our model for these events. So we hope it's um, as influential. Um, our next event as well will focus on children and young people, and it will be taking place on the 27th of April. Um, and as part of that, we'll be thinking about how we can build effective mental health systems for children and young people. Um, there will be a QR code. I think my colleagues will share it in the chat where you can find further details about that. Um, so without further ado, we're going to kick off with our first set of speakers. Um, we've got Elliot and Crown, who've been involved in our Young Change Makers program. This is a collaboration between UK Youth Centre for Mental Health and the Diana Award. And it's a program really designed to centre young people in reimagine uh, the mental health system from their perspective. So um, I'm going to now hand over to Crown to make a start for us. Thank you. Um, Hi, I'm Crown, and I was part of the Young Change Makers program with Elliot as well. And for the Young Change Makers program, it was a program meant to um, empower young people, to give young people the opportunity to be able to create their own campaign for mental health. And um, we're all put into different groups, and my group was called Team Change, and we ran a mental health campaign. And what we wanted to do, our main goal, was to um, influence the attitudes for young Black people's mental health. I mean, influence attitudes towards young Black people's mental health, and also to improve the communication and mental health within the Black community whilst giving young people a voice. So while, why, we met, um, why we decided to go for that was because growing up in a, in a Black household where we weren't really free to speak about mental health because um, most of our parents weren't exactly educated on mental health. We thought it'd be best for us to give the voice to young people because you don't want to be in a situation where you're kind of caged in and are unable to um, speak up about mental health. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of what I just said. The other slide, next, thanks. Um, so why? So um, Black Caribbean adults are more likely to be hospitalized for psychosis than other groups. And there are many more statistics like that. However, it's not talked about in our community. So the reason why we wanted to raise mental health awareness is because all this are happening in our community. However, we don't talk about it. So to obviously get more people to talk about it, to create more safe space for young people to be able to access mental health, to speak freely about their mental health and to be comfortable talking to other people their age about mental health, which is why we decided to campaign for this. 
Um, so how we did it, the next slide, please. Yeah. So we created and ran a workshop for 16 to 25 years old and featuring different activities. So it was a creative workshop. So we had poems, we had um, photography, and we had art as well. So it was basically expressing your mental health using different mediums. And within all of those, we spoke about our mental health and then how it affected us. And I believe it was really effective because we got really good feedback at the end. We had people feeling that um, it was safe. It was great that we had that safe space that we've created where they can express themselves through different means and however they felt comfortable. And then um, what we learned, I'd say, the, sorry, next slide, please. Yeah, what we learned mostly was that we need to give, we need to create more safe spaces like this for people of ethnic backgrounds, because when you grow up in a household where you're unable to speak about mental health, it affects you in the long run. So being told that, oh, there's this safe space where you can talk about your mental health, where you can interact with other people that understand you and understand where you're coming from, gives them more of a chance to be able to express themselves. And then um, apart from the Young Changemakers program, I was also part of the co-producer, which was basically co-producing the Young Changemakers. And this was with the Diana Award. And for this, we, um, for this, I was given various opportunities, like, um, I was given various opportunities with this. So mainly, um, it was mainly being able to have um, a different perspective because now I was co-producing the Young Change Makers. So I was given a different opportunity and a different role entirely. It was like being at the, um, not at the back, sorry. Um, so I was given an entirely different role as a co-producer. So I was co-producing what young change makers were able to do. I was being able to um, communicate with other people. I was given opportunities to speak one-to-one -one and kind of um, produce the whole change makers program. So it was a different thing from being a change maker in itself because I was given that opportunity to be able to direct the, to be able to direct the change makers program, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that's it from me. I think I'll hand over to Elliot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Cram. Um, really great to hear about the initiative you worked um, on with other change makers. Um, and yeah, I just hope this is something that could be replicated and scaled up across the country. Um, it's a really great initiative. Um, and do please do follow Team Engage as well. They're on Twitter and Instagram if you want to find out more about that um, program that Crown just outlined. Um, so I'll now hand over to Elliot, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about um, his work around activism within mental health and young people. Thanks, Kadra, and um, thanks, Crown, for that um, brilliant presentation about, um, yeah, like, like um, Kadra just said, a really, really great project. So I'm just following on from that. I just wanted to talk about being an activist. What does that mean? Um, because I guess one of the uh, great things I feel that will advance, um, you know, justice in, in mental health is encouraging young people to be activists and giving them the confidence to see that they can be. I guess sometimes when we, well, I know for me personally, when I hear the word, when I first heard the word activist, I'm thinking, uh, Elliot, an activist, that's, that's wow, that's, that's a lot. Um, it sounds like there's, there's only a specific way you can be an activist or there's only specific things you can do um, but yeah in this presentation I'd just like to give a short introduction to my story and and how um yeah just doing the things that um, were available to me I could make an impact and um see the impact that others can make in in so many different ways um so next slide please. next slide please so activists what is an activist for me one of the key things that stands out is that an activist um encourages uncomfortable conversations um so activism is not just about um you know social media camp campaigns which are incredible it's not just about um you know books it's it's just any way any form of communication um for a specific advancement of of a of an idea or of of a change that you want to see 
is a form of activism. So activism isn't just a verbal thing, it's communication in any way. Art is a form of, of communication and therefore artists can be activists. One thing that I love to do is poetry. I'm a poet and um, that's an integral part of my activism. Um, you know, just sharing my experiences um, and, and using the arts to sort of express those those um, views um, and 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 also like encourage and, and fight for change. Protest is a form of, of communication. So um, like we say, um, you know, you might often see activism and protest um, as two uh, things that always go together. And um, I guess one of the reasons that is for me is because protest is a form of communication. I think it was Martin Luther King who said, um, protest is the language of the the unheard um so yeah in paraphrase but yeah so um that's that's uh one of the core themes of activism to me um next slide please so um i wanted to ask a question as i was as i was reflecting on what activism means to me um one thing came to mind and if you could have one irresistibly convincing conversation who would it be with and why and that's obviously because if activism, um, a key aspect of it is communication, um, it would be good to think about when you're thinking about, OK, how can I be an activist or how can I encourage activism? Um, one important thing to think about is what conversation do I want to start? What what message do I want to bring? Um, so would it be a politician and a policy? Would it be um, with a friend and a pet peeve? So I put an example here. Um, I don't like like in conversations with my sister, I've always told her about like using full stops when we, when we text. So I feel like it's so formal, like let's just re relax with the punctuation while we're texting and then we can return to that in, in, other, in other times. Um, another one is, um, would it be a family member in a dream? So um, for example, for me as a poet, uh, conversations with my family always encouraging me to, you know, post some poetry stuff and, and you know, do stuff like that that's a that's a conversation that um if they were to to say to me keep on going with the creative post or whatever that that's a form of activism um so yeah this is just to highlight the fact that activism can be so simple and um therefore it's so easy well not incredibly easy but it's it's really um less complicated than we think to encourage activism especially in this area um as i hope to explain as we go on um, next slide, please. So um, activism and advocacy. So my experience of activism literally started with simply sharing my voice and having conversations with friends and family. Um, yeah, just sharing my experiences of mental health. I know Crown talked about, um, you know, the statistics around, um, you know, black young people um, and black people in general when it comes to mental health. And she also talked about the stigma that is there. So I guess my um, start in activism was just literally having conversations with people around me um, and just making sure that we are psychoeducated um, as much as possible. Um, and um, through that, through mental health participation, so I joined a charity to um, you know, participate in, in just influencing services and, and research and the way things are done to make sure that um, mental health services are, are best serving um, the black community um, yeah, that that allowed me to bring my new perspectives into a new room. Um, and I guess, yeah, activism can just start with those smaller conversations and flood out into larger conversations, whether it's at the service level or it's at a national level, which um, I had the amazing opportunity to do with the Young Changemakers Project. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to play a quick game um, based on what I've been talking about and it's called activist or actor. So I'm gonna um, give two examples of some mystery people and um, describe what they do and see whether they are, wh whether you think um, in your own reflections, they are an activist or an actor. Next slide, please. So mystery person number one. So this person is a health worker um, in their, their nine to five, but they also are a local campaigner and a community leader. They open dialogue around mental health stigma and they, um, they, they share information on psychoeducation and, and combat um, yeah, stigma around mental health challenges and, and how that's dealt with in um, their community. 
Um, so yeah, what, what, what do we think? I'd like you to reflect on that, whether you think this person is an actor or an activist. Um, next slide, please. Mystery person too. They are an entrepreneur and a student um, in their nine to five, but they also um, are a mental health participation volunteer. They provide their perspective on issues and they encourage innovation in research and practice. Is this person an activist or an actor? Um, yeah, I'd like you to reflect on that. What do you think? Um, and then next slide, please. So to um, reveal mystery person one, that is actually my mom. So um, my mum is a midwife and partly due to exposure at work and her own experiences in seeing, um, you know, and even if we look at statistics around um, maternal mental health around uh, um, with, with black, black um, women, um, that sort of uh, sparked her interest into mental health um, stigma and how that might affect practice in, um, in the health, healthcare system. And um, through our own conversations as well, um, about you know just speaking about the experience of young black people and mental health and how that parent um child dynamic can really affect how open young people are to share about you know what they what they are going through and, and the support that they need and um through our conversations now she's a champion for um you know combating mental health stigma you know sending um uh broadcasts on whatsapp you know just being a champion where wherever she is um, and I guess for me, that's a really inspiring example of an activist. Um, and it's just to highlight that, you know, an activist doesn't have to be a massive public figure, but it's someone who's committed to communicating their ideas and campaigning for their ideas wherever they have that voice. Um, so, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Mystery person number two is a childhood friend of mine. So um, partly, to, uh, again, due to exposure by um, his parents and partly due to our own conversations, um, we decided to, well, yeah, I sort of um, connected him with a mental health charity, which um, he joined as a volunteer and provided his lived experience as a young black man. Um, and that was a really great experience for me, um, you know, being, to, being able to speak to my friend about something that was really passionate to me and him also developing a passion for it and going out and doing something about it and contributing his voice um, to, uh, you know, advancing this sort of, yeah, this, this idea, this, this um, passion um, that we, we shared. Um, so, yeah, this is another example of someone being an activist um, in their local context or just seeking out activism um, wherever they could. And it's an example of how simply giving young people a platform um, such as this a mental, a mental health charity did um, can make such a difference and, and um, you know, provide opportunities for people who might not see themselves as activists per se, who might have normal um, everyday jobs or, you know, stuff like that. They can also contribute to um, reshaping mental health services and reshaping um, the way we, we tackle mental health in the Black community. Uh, next slide, please. So um, to sort of summarize, so activism for me um, is about activating other, others. So like the two examples there, our interactions activated them to do something different. And I think it's those, that small effect of, well, also there is a, of course a large effect like these um, sort of events where, you know, you get to speak to loads of different people, but also activism is about those individual conversations you have with the people around you and, and the people you have access to um, within your own network. And activists do many different activities, whether it's social media campaigns, whether it's um, simply joining your local um, participatory um, uh, service or yeah, whatever whatever you can do, just having those conversations. And, and like I mentioned, even things like creative arts as well, um, depending on your own skill set and, and what you aim to achieve, you can also be an activist um, and encourage activism um, within your context by platforming those people around you. Next slide, please. So summary, um, number one, uh, encouraging young activists means reminding them of the value of their voices. So like I've spoken here, um, of, you know, two examples of, you know, normal everyday people who have been able to do amazing things and, and sort of go on um, to impact uh, their their area of activism, 
um, that that was just through them seeing the value of their voices that they could actually make an impact. Um, and one thing that has helped me in that is stuff like the Young Change Makers Project, where you know you're given a voice, you're given the opportunity to shape things, um, so that your communication isn't just you know you're not just communicating that you need to see change, but you're given an opportunity to make change. Um, that's um, what encourages young activists. And number two, encouraging activism means opening more spaces for uncomfortable conversations and, and sharing new ideas and new perspectives, such as this event today, the Festival of Ideas. Um, and next slide, please. So my radical idea based on sort of some of the things that I've experienced is to um, um, bring forth uh, lived experience mentors for service management and clinicians giving them an opportunity to have non-therapeutic re relationships with young people and, and, and um, from, from racialized backgrounds so they can actually see um, the day-to-day -day and, and what sort of experiences um, are really valuable to young people and, and what they want to see changed. Um, so it reinstates the value of voices, which again, reinforces that idea that um, if we, we know our voices are valuable, and that we can all be activists, we'll, we'll go in there and we'll participate and we'll help to reshape the services that are available to us and, and create new ones. And also it encourages more uncomfortable conversations where new ideas can be shared and we can challenge ourselves and, and, and ensure that we're best serving the communities we are looking to serve. Um, yeah, and, and that's it. Thank you so much. Wow, that was incredible, Elliot. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, just really challenging some of the misconceptions around activism and advocacy. Um, and you really just outlined some clear steps that people can take every day to affect change um, within the mental health system and towards tackling um, racism as well. Your mum sounds amazing, by the way. <laughs> so I see where you get it from um, and noted your point about not using full stops on text messages. <laughs> because I'm guilty of doing that. Um, but thank you for that. Um, and now we're gonna move on to our next uh, speaker. We're really excited to welcome Dr. Hannah Algali um, from Partisan, which is a really groundbreaking charity that works with black communities um, to talk to us about the role and the impact of racism within mental health services. So over to you now, Hannah. Thanks Kadra. And thank you, Elliot and Crown as well. It's great to hear about your work. Um, Bear with me, this my notes. Hi, yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Hannah. And as Kapja say, said, today I'm gonna to be talking about how racism shows up in mental health services and the importance of services led by and for the people that they serve. And I work for Partisan, which is a really tiny community interest company. And we work with minoritized and racialized young people. And these young people are often at risk of exploitation, criminal exploitation, um, and are often at risk of serious youth violence. And at Partisan, we hope to be really innovative and creative and accessible and person-centered, but we are by no means a perfect solution. And I don't claim to be an expert in this area at all. And I guess what I'm sharing today is some ideas uh, and I'm really open to other ideas and critique. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of kind of personal professional backgrounds here today. And so I hope <clears throat> this presentation, yeah, is interesting and has some things that are helpful for everyone. Okay, next slide, please, Zach, thank you. So I thought I'd start off by telling you a little bit about me and how I came into this work. Um, so I grew up in Brixton when it was a very different place from the place it is today. Um, and from a young age, it became clear to me that um, the people around me were treated very differently by services based on their characteristics, so race and gender and ethnicity being really clear ones. Um, and that was really obvious in my teenage years, at school and in interactions with the police. And although I didn't quite have the language for it then, I think I became interested in social, social justice uh, from a young age. And so I got onto clinical psychology training and I was really excited to be a clinical psychologist. Um, but I got into some traditional therapy services and I looked around and I realised that people who looked like me and who looked like the people I grew up with, I, I wasn't seeing them in, in the traditional therapy services. Um, and so one example of this was um, when I was working in a therapy service in Camden. Um, I was working with um, a young black man who'd been stabbed and he had symptoms of PTSD. And the, the, the service wasn't in a location that he felt safe and he kept missing sessions. And there was so little flexibility about how I could work with him. Uh, everyone was like, he's dna he's missing sessions, close the case. Uh, and I, I didn't want to do that. 
So I took this dilemma to the kind of service team meeting and I was asked in front of the whole team what gang this young man was in. And I was so shocked. He was the victim of violent crime and yet he was being assumed to be a criminal. Um, and so I channeled that anger into approaching the senior leadership team and asking them or getting them, demanding that they um, made changes to the, to the policy, which meant that I was able to see him outside of the clinic. Um, and so I went with him to housing appointments. And suddenly, when we were outside the clinic in a place that he felt safe, he was able to engage both in kind of therapeutic conversations with me, but also in getting his needs met with housing, which is obviously such a priority for safety and for mental health. Um, and yes, yeah, so I, I began to understand and see the value of mental health care being outside of the clinic. And I guess I became very aware, even more aware than I was, of the need for services to work differently if we're going to support racialized communities. And so since then, um, I have worked in a range of settings, a range of services, where the priority is on psychologists doing things differently to support racialized young people, rather than expecting young people to do things differently. Uh, and so, yeah, I've worked at a variety of projects. The one in the middle, Project Future, is kind of like a psychologically informed youth centre in Tottenham, where I worked for a while. It's based on the paper on the right, and um, meeting us where we're at, which is kind of, yeah, an evidence base about how to work with marginalized and excluded young people. And I wrote the article above uh, about psychologists not having to have all the answers. And actually, we need to not know if we're going to be working flexibly with um, our communities. OK, next slide, please. So at Partisan, which is a black led organisation, we think a lot about racism. And to do that, we think a lot about whiteness. Um, so whiteness is often invisible and it's often the kind of taken for granted norm. And at Path Down, we try to make whiteness visible. And we believe this is the first step in anti-racist practice. And so this funnel diagram was developed by Namisha Patel. And it explains the ways in which whiteness and racism are entrenched within psychology and mental health services. I'm gonna try and summarize this diagram really briefly. Um, so it talks about um, racism in mental health services being rooted in colonialism which was uh, the beginnings of racial hierarchies, um, taxonomies and classifications of humans into different subgroups, depending on their appearance, attitudes and personalities. Out of this developed the eugenics movement, which aimed to improve the genetic quality of humans in certain groups and judge certain groups to be inferior. For example, people with disabilities or people from minoritized racial backgrounds and promoted certain groups as being superior. So for example, those who are able-bodied and white. This led to IQ testing, psychometrics, which were inherently racist. Black people were proved to be less intelligent when really the IQ tests were designed by white people for white people. And so then when testing people from non-dominant cultures, they got lower scores. Obviously, not because they were less intelligent, but because the, bat the batteries of tests were not relevant to them and not designed for them in mind. And so this then led and was influential in the knowledge production, which we take for granted within psychology. So the evidence base that we use, the psychologists, is developed from batteries of tests that disproportionately represent white, middle class and other superior groups. Out of this knowledge, um, the NICE guidelines have been developed. And so the NICE guidelines make recommendations for what care people should receive um, and the recommendations for what is normal and healthy is based on all this history of whiteness. And so all of this influences and trickles down into the theories and models we use today. So in the UK, there's a strong focus on Eurocentric individualistic models of distress, for example, CBT, which dominates the profession and obscures other explanations such as systemic, racial and political trauma. And so traditional psycho psychology services are built on all this history and context without acknowledging it. Um, and then in the right of the diagram uh, is shown that how this is kind of uh, how whiteness and racism are reproduced again and again in our mental health services by the teaching and the supervision that we get and actually who gets to be a psychologist in the first place. And so I think it's important to note I spent six years at uni uh, becoming a psychologist and not once was any of this mentioned. Um, and so I'm sure we all have ideas and perhaps experience of how this is experienced by service users of colour. There's often a feeling that we are not understood by mental health professionals and that services are just not set up. Uh, with our needs in mind. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so, what are the alternatives? And so, at Partisan, we try to do something different. 
Um, and when we describe our work at Partizan, we often think about the how, why, and what of our work. And so why, so yeah, the why is our value set, the how is the methods that we use, and then the what looks different every time based on the community that we're partnering with. Um, so we have a belief in equality and rights being paramount and that social justice is an imperative for mental health care. We use decolonized models of therapy, such as narrative therapy. Uh, we use the methods of co-production and partnership working, and we work through trusted relationships. We give psychology away, so we're keen to, I guess, upskill or share ideas from psychology with community organisations if they're interested in it. We obviously don't want to force psychology on people. Um, we use a test, learn and adapt approach, so we're always kind of trying to hold our work to account and make sure that we're, yeah, not kind of assuming that the work we're doing is, is good enough. Um, I guess a little bit like Elliot was talking about, we try to be advocates, we try to campaign for policy change. Often that's about kind of changing the conversation. We don't write policy. We try to change the conversation with the people that we do. And we have a four day working week. Uh, the majority of our team are racialized and we acknowledge the impact of the work on ourselves by having a day off, which is very nice. Um, and so what do we actually do? We try to create alternative help systems, which um, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk about very briefly. Um, yeah, so in, in the top with the bean bags uh, is a project we're doing on Tulsa Estate where we're partnering with St. Matthew's Project, which do amazing work in the community already, um, to co-produce, this is a port cabin on Tulsa Estate, to co-produce and co-design a safe space for young people, young black men uh, in this instance, um, where they get to decide and define what well-being means for them. They get to decide what uh, mental health support they would like to get. And um, they get to build trusting relationships with our team, get to know us, get to trust us. Why should they trust psychologists, given the history that we've just spoken about, uh, before they access support for their mental health needs? On the right is a poster for a piece of work we're doing on Peeps Estate in Lewisham, where we offer kind of like um, well-being ad hoc check-in spaces, a similar approach. And in this project, we're actually, we've also partnered with the NHS with um, IAPT, which is the, uh, the kind of main therapy service down in Lewisham or across the country. And we've actually, yeah, we're doing some work getting an IAPT worker seconded into our project. And then we're feeding back to try and encourage that service to work differently. Um, so I did some training there about encouraging them to, yeah, think more about the needs of racialized young people. And then at the bottom, this kind of like flow diagrammy thing is a piece of work we're doing with the mental health charity Mind. Mind realised that they weren't doing anything uh, about racial trauma to, and supporting young people who are racialised. And so myself at Partisan, Mind and eight young people are re co-researching, co-designing, co-producing something, an intervention for other young people who have experienced racial trauma. And we're hoping, obviously Mind are a massive charity, that this will become something that can be rolled out nationally, um, which is really great. Okay, so the final slide, please. Um, yeah, so I was asked to think about a radical idea to improve mental health uh, for young people who are racialized, sorry, for people who are racialized in general. And this is an idea that Pakistan is moving towards as a part of our strategy in the next few years. It's called participatory grant making, which is a mouthful. It just means giving the communities the cash. Um, and so it's about local communities and local people being in charge of deciding who and what gets funded. And communities have so many ideas and strengths and resources for what they need, but the money, which I guess, yeah, money is, is so important in getting things off the ground, money is held behind a wall. Um, and so participatory grant making is about communities being able to develop and implement their own agendas. This is empowering in itself, it gives the choice back to the community, but it also means that communities get support uh, that is fit for, fit for practice. And so this is me in Morley's, in Elephant and Castle, uh, starting to have some conversations uh, about this idea, what would people do with £100 for their community. Um, cool, so that's, that's everything from me. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was really, really incredible. Um, um, yeah, have lots of questions of my own um, based on what you've said, but yeah, really um, helpful points there in terms of thinking about whiteness as a concept that underpins mental health and psychological theory and practice and something, you know, we constantly need to challenge. And I just really loved hearing about like the multi-pronged approach that partisan take in terms of influence and systemic change. Um, 
you know, the work you do around um, advocacy, but also co-designing alternative models and research with young people is just really, really incredible. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so our last um, but not least speaker is um, Shoran G. Uh, Singh. Um, he is founder of Taraki, long-term friend of Centre for Mental Health. Um, he's going to also be talking to us about racism in research um, and also a little bit more about the role of lived experience in mental health research when it comes to this issue. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Shoranji. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kadra. Thank you to the Centre for Mental Health for the invitation and also to all the other speakers for really instilling a sense of forward thinking and also a sense of hope and optimism, um, which I think is really, really hard to hold on to um, often in, a, in the world that we live in. So I appreciate that and thank you all. Uh, so my name is Sharanjit Singh. I'm the founder and director of an organization called Traki that works with Punjabi communities to reshape approaches to mental health. As well as Traki, I am a PhD student at Oxford University um, and exploring how to develop anti-racist anti approaches to PPI, lived experience involvement in young people's mental health research. And um, so thinking about racism and research, um, I was gonna use today as a chance to kind of talk about some of the, the parts of my lived experiences uh, within Traki and also within my academic journey to think about how racism has actually shown its head um, in the research space. And I was doing a bit of digging into this, um, kind of just sitting down, kind of trying to reflect and, and think back to what really stood out to me in my experiences um, in this area. And, you know, the first thing that stuck out to me was um, something that I had, some, a conversation that I had with my parents um, a while back. And I was, I, was, I was born and raised, I'm born and raised in a kind of baptized Sikh household, Amritdali Sikh household. And I remember when I was away for uni, um, experiencing my own mental health challenges um, and kind of trying to find support for that. I remember coming back to my mum and dad at home and I said to them, you know, have, have, you, have you guys heard of, heard of mindfulness? And they looked at me and laughed and they said, we have, but we've been doing that with you since you were born. And that kind of planted a bit of a seed in my head because I started thinking about why is it that I now saw this as something that was kind of quote unquote legitimate? Why did I see this as something that was apparently new when actually you know, this is knowledge that's existed within so many communities for, for centuries, for millennia. Um, and that really just kind of started my train of thought about like knowledge and how we position knowledge and whose knowledge is seen as more important at different times, whose knowledge is seen as less important. And a couple months later, I saw that in a popular international coffee shop, you could buy a turmeric latte and I'm not gonna lie, when I was younger, my grandma used to give me turmeric and milk when I had a cold. I was like, what even is this? And when I talked to people about it, they were like, what, what is that? I had no idea. Um, but now you can have it as a, as a thing at a coffee shop. And so something changes, these things change over time. Um, and so these types of knowledge, you know, things that are acceptable, unacceptable, things that are, um, you know, worthwhile things that shouldn't be listened to these things change over time and it, this got me really interested in okay how do we create this knowledge how does this knowledge actually make it into our society make it into our consciousness and for me research is the activity of the creation of knowledge um, whether that is you know knowledge on a particular subject knowledge on a number of subjects just knowledge in general um, research is one of the activities uh, that is kind of knowledge creating and I was going to talk about two quick examples of how I believe racism and racist um, infrastructure interacts with research um, and kind of knowledge making practices. So the first I found is about in inequitable kind of data extraction. Uh, and what I mean by this, I'll give you I'll give you the context for this. Uh, so working with Punjabi communities around mental health for about the last five and a half of years, Every, every week we have about three or four researchers who email us and they say, hey, we're doing this research. Here's a participant call out poster. Can you share it for us? And I used to be really excited when I got these emails because I thought this is fantastic to see, you know, uh, our work is being recognized. You know, we're getting, you know, contact from 
academics, you know, PhD students, master's students, all that kind of thing. And I remember we used to share these, um, share these participant call outs because we were told, you know, this research will make an impact. It's absolutely essential. Uh, you know, these challenges must be resolved right now. And actually, I would say maybe less than 5% of those researchers ever actually got back to us about how that research developed, what actually happened, uh, whether this research has been used, whether this has led to any change or any kind of implementation. And over time, I just got a bit frustrated. And I remember just being like, gosh, this is really, really annoying. Um, you know, we've taken over five years to develop and build trust with an audience. Um, build that relationship with communities who are often underserved and excluded from mental health services and mental health research. How can you feel as though you can just message us and ask to do that <laughs> and also not pay us for it? But that's, that's, that's another question. And so I started getting a bit more cynical and a bit more confused and a bit more curious about uh, how this dynamic unfolds, right? Um, and for me, I recognize actually there isn't a feedback loop uh, between research and often the communities that are being researched. Uh, there's no opportunities for co-learning um, and there isn't really a way for communities who share their data, share their knowledge and share their expertise to actually access that again and maybe, you know, do their own analysis, reflect on what is being, um, what is being shared. And one might say that this is a natural way in res which research is conducted, but Ultimately, this leads to knowledge being extracted, repurposed, and then being sold back to communities. And that's assuming that it actually makes it off the digital shelf um, and actually makes it into the implementation phase. And realistically for me, this isn't something that is neutral. This isn't something that's just research culture, but it becomes intertwined with other experiences of like hierarchies and power that we have in our society, including racial hierarchies as well. So research practices um, and kind of the culture of research uh, can willingly or unwillingly perpetuate this type of extraction from our communities who are already losing resources, losing opportunities and are excluded from the knowledge making space. Research systems can perpetuate racism through the lack of strong pathways for people of color, a lack of meaningful representation in different research disciplines and the impact of, you know, even in employment hostility uh, within academic environments as well. And so there's a lot of challenges within the research space, not just in terms of practice, but also in terms of research systems. And so you think, you know, OK, what might the potential solutions to this be? Um, some of the better research partnerships we've developed are people who have reached out in advance of when research happens and people who have reached out to develop genuine and meaningful connections with us. They want to know us. They want to get to know our work. They want to think about how their work can potentially support ours. They want to compensate us and ensure that we're collaborators and partners, um, not just channels to help them gather participants. This is where access to our own data, you know, trying to learn about how we can do our own analyses and draw our own conclusions, uh, because knowledge making process can't be, withheld, can't be withheld from those already marginalized within society, as they'll continually continue to kind of have their stories taken from them and their knowledge and experiences rewritten um, for them as well. So that was the first kind of point I had about research systems and research practices. Um, and I was just gonna kind of, quickly quickly jump into another quick example uh, which is from a funding application that I put in uh, probably about 12, 12, 12, 13 months ago and it really just speaks to a lack of basic racial literacy within the mental health science mental health research community. So doing my PhD I was submitting a funding application about, uh, about a year ago it's for a big national funder, uh, so they could support me in exploring how we can make PPI processes um, anti-racist in young people's mental health research. That's a whole other conversation about kind of PPI and how it can potentially um, kind of perpetuate racial inequalities. Alas, I didn't receive the funding, despite the real excitement about my project from my supervisory team. 
And this happens, this happens, this happens all the time. There are different challenges, different structural issues. But there was one comment from one reviewer that really sticks with me. And they just really didn't understand the purpose of the research. They didn't understand the need for the research and they didn't understand why this research was something that, that, that needed to happen. And I remember reading it and thinking, this person genuinely does not, does not understand the need for um, anti-racist approaches to PPI. And thinking about patient public involvement, lived experience involvement, it's already a topic that um, within some spaces is seen with some suspicion. And so when you then bring the angle around anti-racism into that, you know, you kind of get a double, a doubling of misunderstandings. So I remember um, kind of looking at that comment and looking at the other comments which understood the, uh, which understood the research and provided constructive feedback on other aspects of the application. It was just that this one reviewer seemed completely willing to ignore what I was trying to explain when there were actually other commenters and other reviewers who completely understood it. And so I was reflecting on that. And I remember I did a practice interview where I was quizzed by a team of white academics about why this research was important and why this research was needed. And as someone who also does kind of lived experience practice work, I was constantly, I re recognized I was constantly explaining the reasoning for why experiences of racism and research were important to reflect upon and, and improve. This was tiring, it was emotionally exhausting, and at points it was actually reigniting some of the challenges that I'd experienced in the past as well. And so the question is, how do we create research systems that don't expect researchers you know, lived experience practitioners to recount or relive the potential racial trauma that they've experienced over and over again within decision making processes. How do we develop a mutual understanding of these issues so we can focus on other elements of the research? And ultimately, it's not my job to explain racial injustice to potential reviewers. You know, this is something that they should have um, at least a basic understanding around so that their focus on my and other people's applications can be around the contents of the research rather than why this problem should be researched in the first place. And so for me, that experience lives with me to this day. And it's about the importance of how kind of racist behaviors and, you know, just, just general lack of, of, of social engagement uh, seeps into research and academic culture at different levels. And just very quickly, you know, on the meaningful involvement of, of those with lived experiences and mental health challenges in research, for me, it's a big question about moving from exclusion to meaningful participation. Um, often we know those communities being researched are excluded from decision making in research spaces. They have no say over how they're being researched, what happens to the data and how it can be used. So communities who are already underserved can become further disempowered, uh, excluding them from knowledge making, decreasing autonomy and actually increasing dependency on those who are doing the research. So lived experience involvement, service user involvement, PPI, loads of different words for different things. It all stems from the changes that have been enabled through the disability rights movements and survivor user movements from the 1960s onwards. And it's a way of enshrining the idea of nothing about us without us uh, to improve participatory approaches rather than fostering paternalism about who can and cannot do research. Again, lived experience space is not neutral. You know, their lived experience space, just because it's participatory, doesn't mean it's going to completely overcome all of the racial and other forms of hierarchies we see in our society. So that's something we always need to be mindful of and be reflectful of as well. And we can't, you know, we can't do the kind of discussion today without quickly mentioning the new and seemingly endless report into the Met's uh, kind of Met Police's poli institutional racism, institutional misogyny and institutional homophobia, report after report, which verges on kicking communities whilst they're down, no action. Uh, and this type of research is actually, in my opinion, research that is, 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 is weaponized um, to actually stop action from happening. Um, for me, it reflects deep-seated institutional racism, institutional misogyny, institutional homophobia, and actually protects those who perpetuates this. And so thinking there about how the culture of research can actually be used as a, as a weapon or a deterrent to actually taking steps forward. Um, and I'd just like to kind of very quickly conclude reflecting um, the kind of demeanor of the speakers before me about how we can conclude on hope for equity 
to own and drive forward knowledge making, uh, to increase autonomy so racialized communities can shape, reflect upon and make changes in their own lives without dependency and with the proper tools and skills to be able to face the many different obstacles that we, uh, that we will have in front of us. Well done, yeah. Oh, thank you, Sharanji. Um, yeah, lots of, again, rich and powerful points that you made there. And um, I think chimes with some of what Hannah was saying as well about knowledge production and thinking about ways of decolonizing this, but um, just really admire the work that you do with communities to reclaim this process as well. Um, I do think, you know, there's been like a increased focus on this issue in recent years, but there's still a long way to go towards disrupting the sort of extractive and exploitative nature that we sometimes continue to see in mental health research. And yeah, especially the points I think you made around the commissioning of research itself, it continues to sometimes be a bit of a tick box exercise. So still a lot more to do on that side of things. And again, Hannah, I think you had it in your presentation about um, communities being deemed hard to reach, but actually in this context, research is hard to reach and hard to you know, find opportunities for people to kind of produce and share their own knowledge in that, in that sense. So um, thank you. Um, so Antonio actually sent through some words uh, that he wanted to share with you all that I'll read out on his behalf, if that's okay. I'm still having a bit of tech issues. So um, he says, good afternoon, everyone, uh, accept my apologies for not being able to participate as expected. Um, don't need to be sorry at all, Antonio, as you things happen. Um, but then he says, nonetheless, I'm sure you all agree that no one likes a quitter um, and where there's a will, there's a way. So I wanted to share a few words with you. Um, a short introduction to myself. I'm a mental health activist, anti-racism campaigner and a student. Today's event is very close to me as I am beyond passionate about advancing racial justice in mental health. In a world where young black people with mental health struggles are treated unfairly and not equally, um, and are no longer discriminated against. That's what he would like to see. Um, using my experience as a young black male living with schizophrenia and emotional, emotionally unstable personality disorder, my endeavors are focused on shifting the way the UK views and addresses mental ill health, particularly within minority communities. Without a shadow of a doubt, it is moving to hear our speakers' passion on this work. Together, we can change the world. This year, I am keen on advancing racial justice and mental health within the police practice. I'll be launching a campaign soon on this issue, so please do keep a lookout. Um, again, I'm sorry I can't join you today, but um, we will share further information about Antonio's campaign when it's available. And I'm um, sure Angie, you touched on this already, but it happened to be a bit of a coincidence that our event launched on the same day as the Casey Review, as you mentioned. Um, so before we kick off with questions, I thought I'll take the chair's liberty to get all your thoughts on what you guys would see as like an alternative model or approach to policing, given the findings of today's report. Um, and as you say, it's been, you know, multiple reports concluding the same thing about policing in this sense. So um, yeah, Hannah, would you like to share some thoughts? On, I know you touched a little bit on, yeah, police and their sort of contact and experience with communities. Um, any thoughts on like what an alternative approach might look like from your perspective? Thank you. Put me on the spot there, Kadria, but I'll go, I'll go first, I guess. Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I think I, yes, do we want to talk about reform or, you know, burning the whole thing down? I guess, I guess perhaps it's more, perhaps I can say more if we think about kind of reform. Um, I think I've done quite, I've, oh, well, I've attempted to do some work with the police to help with the police to recognise their own stuff, I guess, when it comes to um, the way that they police our communities. And so I tend to do some work with the police in Enfield about um, uh, trauma-informed policing. So for police to have time to acknowledge the impact of the work on themselves. <clears throat> but it's so difficult within the culture of the police where the vibe is, we're good, we're fine, we don't talk about these things. But I think I think it'd be really important for the police, to, yeah, to acknowledge, to acknowledge the trauma that them that they experience and then they um, recreate within our communities. Sorry. <laughs> and then I guess something else, another service that people can call when they're in distress that doesn't, you know, have all the 
the power um, that, that the police bring. And yeah, so many times young people uh, from Rochelle's backgrounds have talked to me about how they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't know who to call if a family member was distressed or having a mental health crisis. And I wonder how we can yeah, have, have another service that's available to, um, to meet the needs of our community as and when we need it without the fear of being criminalised um, for mental health challenges. Oh, thank you. I know I've put you on the spot, but that was such a brilliant reply. So thank you so much, Hannah. Um, Shoran G, Elliot, Crown, do you guys have any additional sort of reflections or thoughts you want to share about that? Absolutely, just really quickly, and then I'll open it to other panelists. I don't think we, we, we can be scared of the idea of abolition. Um, I think it's a, a practice and approach that um, we can't be scared of talking about and we can't be scared of, of, of offer, offering in our, in our services and our approaches. Um, for me, some of the best work in this space recognises that um, many items on the police's agenda are fundamentally public health issues and also issues related to uh, latent and, and generations old social inequalities. Um, I just think kind of the, the work that I want to highlight myself is the work of the Violence Reduction Partnership in the West Midlands, um, which actually, you know, takes very much a kind of public health approach to questions of policing in a way that I've not seen um, kind of more formalised policing structures do in the UK. Um, and then also the work of NSUN, the National Survivor User Network, who um, have been hosting Synergy, the Synergy Collaborative Centre, which focuses on um, racial justice and mental health and who have just completed one of their um, funding uh, calls for uh, organizations focusing on kind of racial justice abolition and mental health as well and I think if we're able to kind of support and fund the organizations working in this space then we're going to be able to see different approaches um, alternative approaches uh, that can be used in communities up and down the country. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Elia and Cram, would you like to add any thoughts? Um, I think what I'd like to add, I think similar to Hannah, I think they do need to be reformed more of. And um, there's something else I feel I do work with the police a bit. And um, until like two years ago, I'd say I didn't know about something called a scrutiny panel, which is run by the people and it's independent to the police. However, they do scrutinize, like um, they watch body one videos of police officers in action and then they scrutinize those videos and then they judge them on the use of force and things like that. However, those panels are not being, um, what I say, promoted a lot. So most people don't know about it. Most people in the communities don't know about it. Like you have this opportunity to be able to scrutinize and see what the police are doing. And it does get, like when that happens, whatever comes out from whatever the um, scrutiny panels, whatever comes up from them um, scrutinizing those videos, it does go straight to PSD, which is basically professional standards. So if a police officer particularly has um, gone out of his way and used too much force on a particular person, it goes straight to professional standards and then professional standards deals with that. But the thing is that system isn't promoted to the people. And I feel because of that, it's like most of people feel I can't have a say in what police do, but you can, but the police don't promote it as much. So I feel like one, the system needs to change. And um, the scrutiny panels that in every single, every single um, police force area has a scrutiny panel, just people don't know about it. So I think panels like that needs to be promoted for people to know yeah. I have a voice basically. No, that's really helpful. Thank you for yeah um, setting that out for us. Um, and uh, we we uh, received some pre-submitted uh, questions from people who signed up. So um, Elliot, I might come to you for the first question. Just a heads up. Um, so we have a question here from Natalie, uh, who I think I saw in the audience somewhere, um, on how can we create tangible change for those um, who are from the global majority. Um, how can we make sure we are heard within systems and structures in place within our society? Um, so that's the first part of her question. Um, Elia, can I put that to you? Yeah, sure. I guess um, kind of goes back to some of the things we've been talking about, even just thinking back on to the last question, I guess, you know, um, coming to the place of 
uh, admitting that the systems that we are currently using aren't working for marginalized communities. And from there, being able to say, okay, we can change things, we can do things um, that we haven't done before. Um, and, and I guess it's all centered around um, making sure that uh, marginalized voices are are platformed and valued and um, given the opportunity to create their own solutions. Um, so I, I guess that's a really important thing and um, that we're not just um, sort of, yeah, we're not just leaving leaving it to be uh, something that is, is uh, more of the same. So I guess there, there have been initiatives, there have been things that have been done um, and, um, yeah, it's just just allowing um, marginalized communities and, and and you know individuals from the global majority to make the decisions rather than um, sort of yeah taking on the the brunt for themselves because I guess services when we look at um, you know leadership structures and and who really makes up um, those 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 leadership structures it's not people from the global majority. Um, so I guess it's literally just about um, making sure those voices are there and those voices are not just there and, um, you know, isolated, but there and given the power to make change. Um, so whether that's resources, um, whether that's uh, decision making power. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I would say. Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, Hannah, I'm going to come to you for the next question, if that's OK. Um, we have a question here about. Um, how do you think the role of adultification, particularly seen in racialized groups, affects the prevalence and the support for young people's mental health? Yeah, I think it's a massive, a massive problem. And so particularly the group of young people that I work with who are at risk of or have previous involvement with the criminal justice system, there's so much adult, adultification. Um, and I guess an assumption of of, of being bad and being young people being problems rather than being in need of support um and yeah I think I think it it plays a massive role and and, and I think I think language is so important um I attend meetings and the language that's used to talk about a 13 year old child as being manipulative or um yeah it, they're described as an adult I think it's yeah massively problematic and then the question is about how it affects support for young people's mental health, I guess. Sorry. Um, if young people have experienced um, other services as not being helpful, as placing the blame or the problem within them, then when they come to access mental health services, they also assume, quite rightly, that um, those services are going to view them as, as the problem rather than the opportunity for support. And so, so many of the young people that I work with talk about yeah, of course, of course I wouldn't go to a service. It's going to be just like school. It's going to be just like the police. It's going to be just like social care. Um, and so I think we need to prioritise building trusted relationships with young people and with, with all people whose trust has been eroded by the very organisations that are meant to be supporting them. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of adultification, um, uh, Janine Davies, who works for an organization called Listen Up, has like produced some really clear um, explanations about that. But basically, um, it's a uh, it's something that happens within services where young people from marginalized backgrounds, particularly black young people, are treated as though they are older than they are. Um, and so. Yeah, it's something that uh, I think we've seen in cases like the tragic child Q case last year, where, um, you know, they were sort of like accused of criminal behavior within the school setting and assumed to be guilty rather than innocent. So would really recommend checking out her work in that area. Um, so another question that we've received here um, is how can psychological professionals actively contribute to and amplify community led programs that promote mental wellness within racialized communities? Um, Sharonji, I'll start with you and then Crown, if you want to share some thoughts around that as well. Awesome. Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so th the big thing that sticks out to me is if you're looking to work or connect with a particular organization is to kind of connect with them as yourself rather than as a professional connect with them in a way that is meaningful and authentic build that relationship over time 
um, sit and listen and think about the different ways that you can help amplify their work. I think if folks are on social media, just generally, I think amplifying on social media is something that's that's quite straightforward. But if we want to actually be working more closely with community organizations doing this work, don't presume that because I'm a professional, I know that I can support, you know, by doing this, this and that. You know, we, we want to actually be connecting, listening and recognizing where our skills might overlap with some of the things that community organizations are looking for. You know, on one side, that could be, yes, providing some basic kind of training or overview support. It could also be around writing funding applications. It could be actually providing support to review um, different types of comms that the organization might be putting out. So let's not box ourselves in um, because we might be uh, kind of people with uh, kind of mental health expertise. Um, and fu fundamentally, we need to kind of sit, listen and connect over time with community organizations. Um, and think about how we can best fit into their jigsaw puzzle rather than how they can best fit into our jigsaw puzzle. That's brilliant. Thank you. Crown, any thoughts on that as well? I can repeat the question as well if it's useful. So how can psychological professionals actively contribute to and amplify community-led programs that promote mental wellness within racialized communities? Um, I think similar to what the previous speaker said, um, I think it would be more helpful to, to connect personally rather than as a professional. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and then one last question, and Elia, I might get your thoughts on this if that's okay. Um, so we have a question that was submitted here. I believe that schools are a major hot point for the start of racism for many young people. How can we translate our work in mental health to start addressing this within schools? Yeah, this is a really great question and I, I definitely agree. Um, I guess uh, there, there is some work being done um, on this. So for example, um, on the Young Change Makers project, um, there, there's a uh, organization called not so micro that's um campaigning for uh, uh microaggression training for um for uh teachers so that's an example of um maybe helping and ensuring that there is a system in place so that um teachers are informed and know how to deal with um you know microaggressions within schools and and, and things um like that so i guess it's just um as we I think we previously talked about, um, you know, we want young people to be able to trust the institutions and the, the services that are in place. Um, and that starts with, um, you know, the ones that are closest to them. So school is a great, a great example of that. So I guess championing organizations like um, Not So Micro and, and um, campaigns, uh, um, similar campaigns where we're looking to train up teachers and even influence policy so that it's it's included, just like we have um, you know so, uh, you know safeguarding policies um, in general. We should you know have that contextual safeguarding in, in the sense of seeing how racism could affect uh, the young person's experience and how um, yeah that that needs to be protected. Um, so yeah. No, that's a really good point, and I think um, colleagues have shared further details about not so micro in the chat. Um, but what you're saying there that I'm hearing is um, as we approach safeguarding in schools, you know, making anti-racism everybody's business should be, you know, part and parcel. Um, so I think we are going to launch a poll um, just recapping uh, the radical ideas our speakers have shared. So um, Shoranji um, suggested a complete overhaul of the commissioning structure for mental health support. Um, the current system is archaic and disadvantages community organizations. Um, Hannah shared that working to develop a radical alternative help system that makes a participatory grant making a mental health intervention. Um, Elliot has shared lived experience mentors for service management and clinicians is something that needs to be more widely available. And then Crown, uh, a really important point here about thinking about mental health education, support and signposting through religious institutions. So um, please just take a minute to kind of share your thoughts on uh, these ideas, we'd love to kind of, yeah, see which ones are really popular and something maybe that, you know, we can collaborate with yourselves to kind of take forward.
It was a bit of a mixed bag it's looking like on my end so far. All really fabulous ideas, of course. Yeah, people really interested in uh, addressing the sort of commissioning structures and barriers that community organizations face. Um, and then thinking about, yeah, participatory grant making as a tool itself as well. Um, yep, do we want to pause the poll here? Got a couple of minutes to close our event today. Okay, um, I just wanted to thank all of our speakers for their brilliant presentations today. Um, you know, this is just the start of a conversation for us. Obviously, we can't resolve this humongous issue within uh, our also's uh, event today, um, but really, really grateful to you all for sharing your work with us, um, your radical ideas with us. And yeah, we really look forward to kind of continuing to work with yourselves to you know, look uh, forward and be hopeful about the changes, you know, that we can make together. Um, from my personal perspective, I really think, you know, it's the ground up approach that's really critical in this area. For too long, a lot of these groups and ideas have been overlooked and silenced. So, um, yeah, just really massive thank you to you all. Massive thank you also, Antonia, and really sorry about the issues that you had um, with technology. But um, Antonia is going to be speaking in Parliament tomorrow with the All Party Parliamentary Group on Mental Health. So um, hopefully he can, you know, get his ideas across there tomorrow um, with us. Um, and I think uh, details about our next Festival of Ideas event will be shared in the chat. So please do look out for that. Um, and thank you all for joining us for this session. Um, we really hope you enjoy the rest of your day today. Thank you.